Thank you for coming to the uh, Dean's Colloquium of Fall 2018. Um, today is really, I was telling Professor uh, the Jim or Johansson that he just broke them all because today is a big competition. <laughs> Two very interesting colloquia and we cannot be, uh, still we haven't figured out how to be in two places at the same time. So thank you, because I understand that it was probably a very hard decision for many of you. Um, so before I read a brief uh, bio of Professor Bajemo Johansson, I just wanted to say a few words uh, that sometimes I talk to students from different background and uh, the topic of math comes into the conversation and quite often they say, oh math, I hate math, or math is so difficult I don't like it, you know, it's, and I say, but there's beauty in math, and I say, what do you mean, beauty in math, there's no beauty in math, math is all numbers and complicated formulas and uh, so, I think that today, Professor Vegemo Johansson is going to show us that there is, as many of us think, there is indeed beauty in the mathematical concepts, in the symmetry, in a lot of the things that we understand a little bit about math, uh, see. But he's going to give us also another perspective, uh, which is the beauty in the more traditional sense of art that can be created out of math, out of mathematical concepts. And I think that's probably the reason why we have all these people who were throwing where to go, both interesting, but this is extremely fascinating, so I'm going to go to this one. So I really thank you for that. Let me just read a few words about uh, Professor Vegemo Johansson. He started his mathematical career in Stockholm with a master degree and involving in mathematical events for gifted high school students. We know he's a gifted person, so nothing new about that. His PhD was in computational homological algebra uh, from Jena in southern Germany. And uh, since then, he has been working in topological data analysis at Stanford, St. Andrews, in Skogan, and in Stockholm. And then uh, he came here, good for us, to become a, an assistant professor two years ago. In addition to his main research interests, he has a range of side projects, most famously counting connected knots. 266, 682 possible knots for standard negative. I didn't know that. I, I don't think my husband knows that. Oh, let me try. There seems to be no mic. Sorry. There is no mic. Not that I've been able to find. I'm sorry. That was it. His interest in arts comes from his family with the wealth of artists on his mother's side, aesthetics has always been present in his life. Uh, Professor Virginia Johansson is always, always took a more computational and mathematical uh, shape and in the, his interest in art, with very early interest in computer graphics and fractals. And in the last decade, he has been involved with the maker movement and has been using laser cutters and 3D printers to produce mathematically inspired art. Ex I think that he is going to show some of them today. Exhibiting at the largest mathematics conference in the world. He was nominated for one. I wanted to give you a award, but okay. But at least I know that he was nominated for a big award. As well as the foremost conference for mathematics arts. I don't want to give you any more from learning directly from Professor Vegemo Johansson what is beauty in that. Thank you. So first off I want to thank you very much for 
having me here to speak. It's a, I, I feel it's a great honor to be uh, invited to speak at this colloquium, and it's a great honor to be able to speak to all of you, and not just speak to you, but to speak to you of something I've been interested in and passionate about for decades and decades. Arguably since, uh, suddenly since my pre-teen years. So the idea for today is to talk about mathematics and beauty in three different directions. First, I want to convey the idea that mathematics is beautiful in itself, that, that there's an aesthetic sense that tends to drive many mathematicians to do what is, it is we do, to choose mathematics as the thing that we spend our lives with. And once I've tried to bring this idea of mathematics and ideas as beautiful in themselves, across to you, I want to flip the card. And I want to look at how mathematics flows into classical beauty, into the arts, show you examples of where mathematics shows up in uh, art throughout history, and show you examples of the art that steps in to illustrate mathematics, but as fine arts, as uh, higher expressions of artists, not mathematicians. And then finally, I want to talk about the maker revolution. There's been a change in the last decade or two where by now a whole lot of manufacturing techniques are available to most people. It's suddenly cheap to do the kind of prototyping and manufacturing that used to be extremely expensive and require you to set up a uh, business around to do it. By now you can buy a 3D printer or a laser cutter and keep it at home. And with a little bit of computer skills, a little bit of the design skills, you can produce shapes, not quite, but almost any kind of shape you can conceive of. Which means that we can create shapes uh, that represent the, uh, the more geometric, the more tangible of the mathematical objects that I uh, find beautiful. And I want to show you some examples of how mathematical objects get reified, get created as physical objects using the tools from the Maker Revolution. And also highlight some of the artists that impress me the most in this new movement of uh, maker fueled mathematical artists that has shown up in the past couple of decades. But for starters, I want to talk about beauty in mathematics. Because this really is one of the things that fuels me personally. One of the things that made me a mathematician. And in order to start talking about it, first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about the kinds of things I'm not planning on talking about. So, Vivian, uh, Dean and Sarah mentioned uh, fractals in my bio. Uh, these showed up in the uh, mid, late, mid to late 20th century, around 1970. Um, and they're gorgeously intricate and complex pictures that emerge out of studying mathematical objects themselves. Where the beauty is a product of visualizing a mathematical process itself. So it's more close, it's a Mathematical, ob inherently mathematical object that happens to be beautiful. And that's not quite the kind of beauty that I want to talk about. Uh, it drove me uh, and my passion for quite a long period in my mid to late teens. I would sit around uh, programming my own computer to draw fractals, and I would sit around with uh, custom built programs that create practice, and I would explore, and I would read books on it, and I spent several years fixated on these things. And as with almost everything that I do, mathematics seems to be a glorious exception. After a couple of years, I get bored, and I moved on. And so I did with fractals. Uh, I still find them utterly gorgeous. I still find them beautiful. But it's a different flavor of beauty, at least in my mind to the kind of beauty that drives me and makes me a researcher and makes me a professor. Instead, 
I want to talk about the aesthetics of ideas. The idea that an idea in itself can be beautiful. And that the beauty of the ideas can be the thing that drives our interest and captures our attention. And there's, if you start asking around among mathematicians, you'll often meet this opinion that we're doing mathematics because it is beautiful. And the beauty that we're talking about often ends up being described as elegance. Uh, when I was studying for my masters, I hung out with a bunch of masters and PhD students. We had a little study group going, a group of friends going. And at one point I got curious. And I started asking my study mates uh, and my friends at the Department of Mathematics in Stockholm what it was that made them go for mathematics. Because by the time you're surrounded by PhD students and master students, we've ended up showing a higher dedication to mathematics than uh, most people really. Uh, definitely higher dedication than the people who get their bachelors and go up and earn way more than I do uh, by taking industry jobs. Um, so, I, so I had a circle of friends where everyone had this higher dedication to mathematics already in place. And I was curious where, where it comes from. And so I asked around among my friends for what is it that makes you stay in mathematics? What is it that makes you want to spend this time and this energy on mathematics itself? And I had one friend, he told me that he viewed algebraic geometry as a slightly more advanced form of Sudoku. <laughs> Sudoku? Uh, I had one friend who started out in philosophy, who was studying philosophy, who was studying philosophy at a graduate level. And at one point, one of his professors said that there's no truth to be had anywhere. Except possibly, there's a minute chance that maybe mathematics can make a claim to truth. And that in itself, mostly because mathematics can divorce itself from reality. So we're not getting stuck in mathematics and the kinds of limitations that defeats the search of truth for everywhere else. I'm not sure I necessarily agree with the philosophy professor, but I'm not sure that I disagree either. I'm going to stay away from philosophy in my own daily work and leave it to the people who actually want to dig into these details. But this friend of mine, he heard this about the beauty, uh, um, about the truth being attainable in mathematics, if at all, if ever. And so he started looking into it, he started reading up on logic, he started looking into mathematics, and he got so captivated by the notion of being able to come closer to actual truth that he switched fields. He left philosophy completely. When he switched departments, he came to mathematics and made his career as a mathematician instead. Because that would be at least closer, if not arriving at truth. And so, so far in my tally of my friends, I have one Sudoku solver and one truth seeker. And then I found at least one, maybe several, I can't quite remember the details. This was... I don't even want to count, decades ago. Uh, but I did find at least one other study mate of mine who shares my answer to this question. That we do mathematics because it is beautiful. Because it's an intrinsically aesthetic discipline. Because we see a great overlap between what we do when we do research and what I observe my uh, family doing. My one aunt has been uh, making her living her entire life as a picture and, picture and sculpture artist. She's, that's how she's earned her daily bread. And I see great parallels between what she does in making art actually pay for a living and what I do in making mathematics pay for my living and in what we do to come up with the things that we do in our processes and in our motivations why we do it. So for me, and for this one friend that I found, the underlying driving idea is, and the underlying driving thought that keeps us in mathematics is because it's so strikingly beautiful. And it's a re it can be a real head rush. The feeling that I get 
when ideas slot into place, when a proof finally materializes, when I discover something, even if it was already known, learning is itself a kind of discovery. You're learning something that is new to yourself. It might be known to others, but when you learn it, it's new to you. And this feeling of taking a step, of finding out something that you didn't find before, and especially doing it when you have pieces that just slot together and neatly fit one another. That is actually kind of euphoric. And I want to spend my life doing mathematics because I want to seek that flash, that step of finding ideas fitting together, being able to slot them together, and being able to feel that rush of having found something out that I didn't know before, of having created something that I didn't have before, and seeing something fit together nicely, neatly, elegantly. And so this brings me to elegance. I mentioned it earlier as one of the key keywords that keeps showing up when you talk about beauty with mathematicians. And it's really a core feature of what we consider to be beautiful mathematics. Often mathematics is considered to be beautiful when it is elegant. Which means that instead of defining beauty, we're now stuck with defining elegance. And the great number theorist G.H. Hardy, uh, English mathematician, active during the Second World War and who wrote a book called The Mathematician's Apology where he talks about why he does mathematics. And for him, the ability to be useless was a driving force because he lived during the war. He didn't want to contribute to the horror of a world war. And so being able to do mathematics that couldn't conceivably be used was an important driving factor for him. Which is kind of ironic since the things he did is part of the foundation of modern day photography. So it ends up being, a, it ended up being really useful in the end. But he describes beauty in mathematics as coming from three factors from inevitability, from unexpectedness, and from economy. Inevitability in that there really wasn't any other way that this could fit together that this idea could be, that this proof could be. Unexpectedness in that there should be some surprise in it. And this is a big part of what drives me and my sense of beauty. The juxtaposition of weird combinations of ideas is a big driver with me. Being surprised at seeing things put together that I didn't expect would fit together. That's a big part of what drives me in mathematics. And then economy. Being able to prove something with way less work than you might have expected to be, or that you might have thought should be necessary to do something. Having something that you can express more economically than you should have. Those were things that Hardy considered to be essential for mathematical elegance. Uh, one factor that I would like to add to this list is explanatory power. Being able to bring understanding with your mathematical ideas. There are, there are many ways you can arrive at mathematical truths. Some of them are sluggish. I'm sure that breaks economy. Where you just have to churn through all possible options and settle that truth holds because in every conceivable case you can separately show that it holds. This sort of brute force kind of mathematics is entirely possible, but I don't tend to find that elegant. Uh, partially because it rarely imparts an understanding of what is really going on. Instead, one of the factors I find really elegant is when you gain an understanding for the object that you study from the idea that you build. Paul Erdős, to bring up another historic mathematician, uh, he was a ridiculously productive Hungarian from that source. He uh, collaborated with everyone he interacted with, pretty much. Uh, and he, he's really famous for several reasons, one of them being that he collaborated so much. Uh, another reason being that he actually launched several mathematical subfields of his own. 
This co co collaboration is so extensive that mathematicians uh, sometimes measure themselves in their distance from Erdős. So if you're Erdős yourself, the distance is zero. If you collaborated with Erdős, if both of you published a paper together, you're at distance one. If you collaborated with someone who collaborated with Erdős, you're distance two. I'm distance three. Nice. Uh, and Erdős had a lot of idiosyncrasies, had a lot of weird things he was doing. And one of the weird things he was doing that actually captures something essential is he kept talking about God's book. The idea is that God keeps a book in which is written all the perfect proofs. The most elegant proofs of each mathematical theorem are gathered in God's book. And then points Erdős made after having introduced this idea is you don't have to believe in God. It's not expecting you to be a theist in order to be a mathematician. In fact, I'm not so sure he believed in God. But he does believe in the book. God is optional, the book is not. The notion of the perfect proof is not optional. The notion of the perfect proof is there. And there's a goal for mathematicians to strive against. Now, I've talked about proofs quite a lot. But I, in order to try and convey uh, what, I, what I consider to be beautiful proofs, I probably should show you at least a couple of proofs. So Pythagoras' theorem is possibly the most famous theorem in the world. I hope this looks vaguely familiar to everyone in the audience. <laughs> Pythagoras' theorem says that if you have a right angle triangle, and you square the lengths of all the sides, then the sum of the two shorter sides, squares, is equal to the square of the larger side. As so you can summarize this with an equation, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, after you label your sides a, b, and c. You can find examples. Uh, if one side is 3, the other is 4, then 3 squared is 9, 4 squared is 16, 9 plus 16 is 25. And the third side of that triangle has length 5, so we do have that 3 squared plus 4 squared is equal to 5 squared. This was known in ancient Greece. Uh, it's named for the Greek mathematician Pythagoras for a reason. And here's one of the most beautiful proofs I know about the, of the theorem. On both sides we see a square with side length A plus B. You have the short side of the triangle, you have the long side of the triangle. You have the short side and the long side. And this is symmetric, so you have the long side here and the short side here. You have the short side here and the long side here. So both of these squares have side length A plus B. So they have to have the same complete full area. And this blue here is the same blue as here is the square of the long side uh, of the two sides, two outer sides of the triangle. This pink one up here is the small square. And this red here, even though it's tilted, is still a square. You can convince yourself with that by fiddling around with angles a little bit. And it has side length, the length of the long side. And what's left over when we've taken out these squares that, we need, that we're trying to show occupy the same amount of space is one, two, three, four yellow triangles that each is equal size to the other or one, two, three, four yellow triangles over here. And so since the leftover area is the same the things we take out have to be the same. And so therefore the square of the, the sum of the square of the sides has to be equal to the square of the hypotenuse. There's a sheer elegance to having a proof that comes together just from a picture. You have to meditate over the picture. You have to actually spend some time yourself figuring out how the picture connects to the theorem you're trying to prove. But it really, the proof really is completely contained in the picture. Here's another one. If we take an infinite sum, we start up with one quarter, 
and we add 1 16th, and we add 1 64th, I'm going to start screwing up my arithmetic real soon as I'm going to stop mentioning numbers. If you sum up the powers of one quarter, you will get one third. This is not obvious from just looking at the numbers one fourth, one sixteenth, one sixty fourth. So it's something that you might feel the need to prove, and here's a proof. Admittedly, it's a picture, but it's a proof contained in a picture. It's a proof without words. And the proof goes like this. We split up the triangle into four equal sized triangles. And then, we, then we paint one of them blue. So this is one quarter of the entire thing. Then we focus on one of the triangles and we split it into one, two, three, four triangles of equal size. And we paint one of them blue. This is now one fourth of one fourth of one sixteenth. We do the same thing again and we get one fourth of one fourth of one fourth. Do it again and we get one fourth of one fourth of one fourth of one fourth. And we continue until infinity. And so what's in blue here is the portion of the triangle that is captured by this infinite series. So now let's count this area in a different way. In the bottom row we have three tri triangles, and one of them is blue. In the next row we have three triangles, and one of them is blue. The next row we have three triangles and one of them is blue, and it keeps on being three triangles to each row. And so therefore, the total amount of area captured by these blue triangles has to be one third. And that is a proof without words of the equality between the, uh, these two values, of the sum of quarters and one third. I find these proofs without words to usually be very elegant, if nothing else, then because they tend to they tend to have to be insightful in order to get the idea across without having to talk about it to get the get the proof across. Here's a second famously elegant proof. Theorem is there are infinitely many prime numbers as I'm sure at least one or two in the audience remember. A prime number is a number that is divisible, is a whole number that is divisible only by one and itself. We tend to exclude one. We don't, don't make one count because it makes theorems you want to prove about it awkward if you allow it in. And the theorem says there are infinitely many of these. This was proven by Euclid with this proof, if I remember my history correctly. The proof goes like this. Suppose that there weren't infinitely many number, prime numbers. Then there would be finitely many. So we could take a list of all possible prime numbers. Then we can multiply all of those together. That gives us some big number. We can add one to that number. Now, even numbers all go in steps of two. So if you have an even number and you add a one, that's no longer an even number. Numbers divisible by 3 go in steps by, of 3. So if you have something divisible by 3, and you add 1, then it's no longer divisible by 3. And this holds for every prime number that if you add 1 to an even multiple of that prime, it's no longer an even multiple of the prime. And so this number that we create, the product of all primes plus 1, has to be a number that is not divisible by any of those primes. And so there has to be a number a prime number that is not in our list. It turns out this number doesn't have to be this number. It might be another number that happens to be an even uh, factor in this new number, but knowing that we have a number that is not divisible by any of the primes that we have tells us that our list couldn't possibly have been complete. And I can do this no matter what list you propose. So. There can be no finite complete list of primes, and therefore primes are infinitely many. And this is a nice, compact, elegant proof. It's, it's economic, it's inevitable, it fo follows straight from the most elementary uh, facts you can establish about how multiplication of whole number works. And 
inevitability, economy, and of course I forget the third party criterion. But it, this tends to be one of the first theorems proposed when you ask a mathematician what they consider to be elegant in mathematics. Here's another one. Who here has ever played Tetris? Awesome. Who here has ever heard of Tetris? Please let me see all hats. Uh, so Tetris, you fit together these shapes, the tetron, tetron minnows, the shapes you can build by fitting four squares together so that each square glues along one side. And so you can ask yourself, can we use these to tile a rectangle? When you play Tetris, you keep getting more and more of these and you try to fit them in a rectangular box. But we could do something simpler than trying to solve all of Tetris. We could ask, if I'm just given these, can I then fill a triangular box? So, sorry, rectangular box. So we can definitely do it if we take a couple of them. There are a couple of ways we can create rectangles out of Tetris pieces. The question is, the question I, want, I really want to pose is, can we do it with all of them? If I take one each of all of these tiles, can I build a rectangle? And one of the nice ways to uh, answer this question is to shift how you think about them. You could start out trying to build one, but just because I'm not smart enough to build a rectangle doesn't have to mean that it can't be done. It doesn't meet the standard of mathematical proof to just try it and fail. That's not enough. We want to be able to convince ourselves that it couldn't possibly be done, rather than just, I can't do it. Because frankly, there are people who are way better at Tetris than I am, and could hope to ever be. So we need to do something about these tasks, to figure out how we could, uh, how we could deal with whether or not we can tile them. And one way to think about how they fit together is to say, well, let's pick a chessboard. Something where colors alternate. And you know what a chessboard looks like. Everyone, they have alternating black and white squares. And so we can pick a chessboard and we place our tiles on the chessboard so that each of the red squares in the tetromino covers exactly one square of the chessboard. And so, by the way that the chessboard is colored, the tetrominos is going to sit on alternatingly dark and light uh, squares. And we can start counting how many dark squares and how, how many dark squares and how many light squares are covered by a tetromino. We get two dark and two, two light, except for one of them. The T shape covers three of one and just one of the other. And of course, if you put up a rectangle, you're going to end up having, um, if you put up a nice enough rectangle, I'm going to start with saying right now, because I haven't actually thought this part through well enough to be absolutely sure of what I'm saying. If you have a rectangle with even number of uh, squares, then certainly you will have to uh, have an equal number of dark and light squares, and we have six tiles. Each of them occupies four, uh, four squares, so we're going to have to have an even number of squares. So we're going to have to use equally many dark and light tiles, but we have this one. And this one consumes three dark tiles, but only one light tile, or three light tiles and only one dark tile. So it creates an excess. We no longer can make the count of dark and light tiles go uh, get, go together. And this proves for us a theorem. The theorem that it is impossible to tile a rectangle using all six tetrometers. You could extend this argument quite comfortably to say that if you have an odd number of the t-time, you still can't do it. But I didn't really want to spend today talking about tetrometers, so instead I'm going to move on. And I see very few glazed over eyes in the audience. This feels really encouraging. 
I haven't scared any of you to death quite yet. Maybe I can get through this without without scaring any of you away from mathematics. I would, of course, want to draw all of you in, but that might be possibly too high of an expectation for just one talk to accomplish. So instead, I want to plant the seed of mathematics as something elegant, something beautiful, something worth looking more into at some point. And instead, let's move on away from the beauty of ideas and into how mathematics shows up in the arts. Of course, one way it shows up is in perspective and the te technical aspect of how to paint. Uh, the discovery of perspective in art history changed the way art looks significantly, and if you go into art history, you'll hear a lot about this. If you go into uh, trying to do art practically, you'll hear a lot about this. And there's significant amounts of mathematics hiding behind how perspective works and why. But I'm trying to talk about more explicit manifestations of mathematics. So this here is a famous uh, copper etching by Albrecht Dürer. Uh, it features the angel Melancholia. There's endless amount of art theory written about this painting, and I'm not going to try to give a coherent analysis. Instead, I want to point out that there's a fair amount of mathematics included in this picture. There's sort of the obvious. We have a sphere here. We have a polyhedron here. And this turns out to be, and now I need to check my notes, a truncated triangle or trapezohedron. So it's not even one of the most classical polyhedra that people who have encountered polyhedra might have heard about. It's a slightly weirder one. But there also is a magic square up here. There's uh, 16 numbers arranged in a square that happen to have 15 and 14 next to each other, so it can code the year the painting was, uh, the uh, etching was made. But it's a magic square. And magic square here, here means that every row, every column, and every diagonal all sum to the same number, all sum to the number 34. And which squares are ma magic and how to create them, that's another fun uh, sidetrack side that delves into mathematics that we could take, but I'm not going to because now I'm talking about art. So Dürer is one of the r really early examples of where mathematical objects appear in what we now recognize as indubitably fine art. I said I wouldn't be talking much about, more about perspective, but I'm going to break that promise, at least for a little bit. Um, in the 1500s, when perspectives started really getting settled as a cool and new and useful technique, people started playing games with it. So there's this one thing that happens a fair number of times called anamorphosis, where the painters put in weird smears. I hope everyone can see that there's something weird at the bottom here. I don't know how visible this slide is to people in the back or people close to this thing. Uh, but there's this weird smeared up thing here at the bottom that doesn't really look all that much like anything at all except for a little weird bit that's thrown into the picture. And it stays that way until you start looking at the painting from an extreme angle. And once you tilt the painting until it's almost no longer visible. This is what you get. All of a sudden, everything else in the painting is no longer really looking like anything. Everything else gets squished up by shifting the perspective with which you view the painting. But that smear of bits by squishing it together comes together and forms a really rather nice painting on a skull. And in order to do this painting, the painter would have had to figure out how to go from being able to paint a skull, which he clearly was able to, to how exactly to stretch it out so that the skull would show up at an extreme angle. There's numerous places where symmetries show up in art. Uh, and there's a lot of mathematics that goes into symmetries. This is a rich area to draw from when we want to talk about mathematics in art. So, for instance, you can uh, ask yourself, these kinds of wallpapers, 
There are some ways that you can say that some wallpapers are similar to others, even if they look completely different, because they repeat in roughly the same structure. You could argue that these kind of circular designs that spread out with a lot of symmetry, that those have similarities. Suddenly, if you have something that looks like a four-leaf clover and something else that looks like a four-leaf clover, they have this four-leaf cloverness in common with each other. And so, one really nice corner of mathematics has looked into this and looked into, well, what are the possible ways that uh, wallpapers could be similar to each other? What are the possible ways that these rosette shapes could be similar to each other? Uh, what are the possible ways that if you put a frieze up on, along a wall, that the friezes could be similar to each other? You can have different ways that the symmetry shows up. That is not really dependent on what the exact shape that you draw is, or what the colors you chose are, but are a product of the abstract shape of the symmetry itself. And it turns out we can enumerate those. We can list the possible symmetries quite well. For wallpapers, there's quite. Please, mathematicians, tell me that I'm not misremembering things here. 17. 17. Thank you. Uh, there's 17 possible wallpapers. And there's an ongoing, often on again, argument since well over 100 years ago about whether or not every single wallpaper symmetry can be found in the Span Spanish Moorish fortress of Hamra. Personally, I think it's a beautiful idea, so I choose to believe that they can be. But it seems from people who have actually tried that it might be a question of how you interpret the symmetries. But at least the idea is there, the claim is there that you can find all possible wallpaper symmetries replicated in the Islamic art at Alhambra. And please ignore the 12 over there. There used to be a big production of mathematical models. If you were teaching or doing research on wave surfaces, it would help to have the wave surface in your hands. So if you visit old mathematical departments, especially Germans seem to be really keen on these, you will find plaster models or papier mache models or tangible models of interesting surfaces. And this ended up getting picked up and used in uh, Dadaism. The Dadaist photographer Man Ray ran into some of these surfaces at the famous Institut Henri Poincaré in Paris and ended up photographing it uh, from several different angles and make it into art by making it into his pictures of an existing uh, surface, pronouncing it as art by being an artist who pronounces something as art. And I really should avoid veering sideways into Dadaism and Marcel, Marcel Duchamp and ready mates so let's move on before I get too tempted to possibly the greatest <coughs> mathematical artist that I know. Um, of course, I forgot to look up what MC stands for, but MC Escher is uh, a Dutch artist who used a lot of mathematics in his work. For starters, he used a lot of mathematical shapes. He would have stellated polyhedra. He would have families of shapes just floating in space because of the beauty of the shapes themselves. And he picked up the Möbius strip, one of my favorites, in several different drawings that he made. So the Möbius strip you get when you take a strip of paper or something, you twist it one half turn, and you glue it back together. And by the half turn twist, the two sides of the paper strip fuse together and become just one side. So you have a shape that is, that is uh, bounded by just one circle that loops around twice, and has just one surface, because the top and the bottom end up being the same size, something that Escher tries to illustrate with his hands crawling around uh, on a nervous room. But going beyond having mathematical shapes, Escher also spent a lot of time thinking about and obsessing about mathematical symmetries. And here we can see what I was trying to express earlier when I talked about wallpaper groups, that there are ways that things are similar where the shapes are not. So for instance, this picture and this picture, they're different 
One of them has birds, the other one has fishes and birds. Uh, but they have similarities in how they are replicated. The figures flip around back and forth. And you can sort of shift the entire thing and overlay it on itself so that you move the entire path and it returns to where it was. So there's definitely something going on that is in common between them, even though there's a whole bunch going on here that is different. And that's the kind of abstraction that wallpaper groups capture. And Escher made a lot of drawings that do these kinds of tilings. And here I'm showing you primarily tilings that capture plane geometry. We'll get into non-plane geometry next. Because you might do this not just where geometry behaves the way you would expect it to, where you just put out a sheet of paper and draw on it. You could imagine doing geometry on the surface of a sphere, and that changes the way that geometry behaves. That changes the way that sizes behave, that angles behave. And Escher explored uh, spherical geometry at Paramount. He had spherical distortions in pictures. He had a whole lot of pictures that play around with spherical optics, holding up spherical lenses or spherical uh, mirrors and drawing what he saw in those. There are several self-portraits of Escher where he looks into a mirror ball and draws the distorted image that he sees inside the ball. And Escher also got really hooked, and I believe I have some vague memory of this being in communication with some mathematicians about it, but really hooked on projective space. So you can tell, you can classify possible geometries into three groups. Flat, spherical, and projective, depending on how they curve, whether they slope downwards or upwards or not at all. And I'm simplifying to the point where I'm fully expecting my colleagues to miss a little, but I really don't want to dig into what this means. I just want you to know that there are three different kinds of geom geometry. There's spherical, there's flat or Euclidean, and there's hyperbolic. And there's a way of depicting hyperbolic geometry where you take just a circle and you fill it with the geometry. And as you get closer and closer to the edge of the, this disk, your sizes shrink smaller and smaller and smaller. So you fit infinitely much space inside this bounded disk. And Escher has a whole bunch of pictures playing around with this geometry, doing the same kind of tilings that he did here. He just fits shapes together with some sort of symmetry going to them. But he does them in a hyperbolic space. So it fits shapes together, and then they shrink as they go out. And this influences what it has to do to fit them together. Having done non-Euclidean geometry, Escher and some other artists, there's a Swede coming up here, to my own great pride, uh, then go on to deal with impossible geometries, things that couldn't be realized in uh, real space, because they break some notion of what, how things should, should behave. So we have these uh, shapes where water flows down into a waterfall that ends up at the source. So either the water has to flow upwards or the source has to, there, there has to be something weird going on here for this water to work. We have stairs that keep going downwards but connect back to themselves. And these sort of things where if you look at any one part. If you zoom in on a little bit of the stair, it's very obvious that the stair is headed downwards. But when you try to put it all together, you get something that breaks. You get something that is impossible. And this, guy, this kind of thing uh, got picked up by a Swedish artist. Uh, came some ideas got found, by, found out by a Swedish art, artist, Oskar Rønkersvær, and who has this it's now called a Penrose Triangle, which is a a triangle built out of rectangular blocks, but where what's up sort of moves around as you go around. And so it seems like you have these straight blocks going around, but they can't, couldn't possibly connect the way that they do and still be straight blocks. And one of my favorites is the Devil's Fork, uh, where if you look at the top of it, up here, it's clear that it's a monument with just two pillars going down. 
if you just look at the bottom, <laughs> it's clear that it's a, a monument standing on three pillars, but taken together, the transition from being one to the other sort of gets lost in the middle. So if you look at each part locally, if you focus in on a part, it looks good. It looks like something we can believe in. But when put together, it looks absurd. If you happen to be a topologist, uh, these following five words are for you. This can be seen as an example of cohomology. That's all I'm going to say about that. Which brings me, with five minutes to spare, to the maker revolution, and where I can see myself entering this picture. So a couple of decades um, before what I consider to be the contemporary maker revolution, we already had crafters who were also mathematicians. The mathematicians who also did crafts, and who do come together and talk to each other about what they do. Every year in January, there's a big mathematics conference that wanders around the US. Uh, this past January, it broke 6,000 participants, and I've heard people say that it's the biggest com mathematics conference in the world. Um, and one of the social events that happens there is one of the nights, a group of mathematicians book a ballroom in whatever hotel we're in, and hold the mathematical knitting circle, which isn't uh, concentrated to just knitting. They're welcoming any fiber arts you feel like, and if you happen to have non-fiber art projects, you're also welcome. But it's called a knitting circle because a knitting circle is a thing that we know exists and that we recognize and can associate to immediately, where we don't have to explain what's going on. And from the mathematical knitting circle has emerged se several books where that collect crafting projects that are directly built on mathematics, where in the same chapter you have a text explaining the underlying mathematics, mathematics that the crafting project is explaining, and instructions for making a crafting project. So you could have a quilt that displays the abstract algebra of a finite group. You could have a knitting that uh, shows the structure of a Mobius strip. lets you interact with the map uh, more directly and lets you build, put the map into your activity as a crafter into the creation of what it is you do. One of the things that has happened is there's been a small movement of people crocheting hyperbolic planes. So the same kinds of shapes that I showed you with Asher with things get smaller and smaller towards the edges. If you, instead of letting them shrink, allow the paper to buckle, you can represent them so that the same size stays the same size as you go out. But you need to fit more and more space in the same place. So the whole thing starts crinkling up and becomes this wavy, crinkly ball uh, that gets more and more wavy the bigger it gets. So there's been art exhibits with crocheted hyperbolic surfaces creating entire coral reefs. And as I was talking about, we are now in a place where computerized tools are accessible. You can get a 3D printer for a couple of hundred dollars. They sell them at Walmart. And so it's not the cheapest hobby that you could imagine, but it's something that you could do for a hobby. My father bought one a couple of years ago, not really knowing what he wanted to do with it, just thinking that it was cool and he wanted to do something with it. By now he's designing and printing his own suckers of Catan board. Um, so all of a sudden, we have access to computer-controlled manufacture on an individual basis, on a private basis, where you don't have to build a company, you don't have to talk to factories, you don't have to make it complex to make new things. And put tools like this where you can just design something, possibly by programming something that generates a design, and then creates a real object. Putting this, and by real object, I really do mean a real object. Putting something like this in the hands of mathematicians who are already interested in making art or already interested in taking the mathematics that they do and creating physical representations of it, has created a bit of an art movement in itself, where people use laser cutters 
a laser cutter focuses a high power laser on whatever material you put under it and uh, evaporates or burns a tiny bit of it and then you move this laser around. And moving it around means that you can put out patterns or you could even cut through and not just itch patterns but cut out shapes. And this has gotten picked up by mathematical artists. I exhibited a collection of hyperbolic plane tilings, again, going back to the same inspiration as Escher, but etched into glass coasters. So you could pick up a glass coaster like this and, and see the hyperbolic plane up close. Uh, in recent ma years, math art conference exhibits, there have been people that have cut out layer by layer by layer and stacked layers to create integrated patterns. And people who build uh, boxes out of cutting and etching each piece with something mathematical on it and then fitting them together. There's 3D printing. There's a bunch of different processes. I'm running over by now, so I really shouldn't go into the details of how 3D printing works. Corner me once I'm done talking and I'm happy to talk your ear off about different techniques for creating three-dimensional objects from a computer model and how they differ and which ones I'm curious to try and which ones I find just annoying to try to deal with. But there's an artist, Bathsheba Grossman, who has been uh, selling these uh, to great success for quite some time. She was one of the first to really take mathematics into 3D printing at scale. There's a mathematician I'm perennially impressed by, Henry Segerman, who recently released a book on how to pick up 3D printing and use it to visualize mathematics and use it to teach mathematics. Use it to get close to mathematics yourself. And there are numerous artists who pick up 3D printing and create art. I find these shapes by Carlos Aquin to be really cool, and of course I really like my own 3D printed art. <laughs> I have them with me so that you can look at them after the talk is finished. The really cool thing is done by a friend of mine. Fabienne Serrier uh, made a Kickstarter, got a bunch of money from people trying to help her fulfill her dream, bought an industrial knitting machine, uh, managed to hack her way through the proprietary protocols to control it, and now has a computer-controlled knitting machine that does whatever she feels like doing. And so she's creating uh, on-demand or by herself exploring scarves. We will be showing one after the talk. Uh, that contain patterns from cellular automata, which is a mathematical way of creating complex patterns from simple rules, or fractals, or even programming uh, language excerpts that have cool properties, where she knits the mouth on this industrial knitting machine. And if you get a Serrier scarf, uh, then it comes together with a little note that contains the entire code needed to replicate the pattern that she used. She sends you not just the scarf, but the source code for creating it as well. A really impressive thing she had done that showed up at the Mathematical Art Conference this past summer is they figure out how to do this on a movie strip. So now not only do you do these cellular automata scarves, but she ended up doing it so that she could wrap it around, flip it over, and fit the ends together so that the pattern moves smoothly across the scene. And this turned out to be something that required the creation of new mathematics in order to fulfill the art artistic vision. And having run over by three minutes, what I want to finish with saying is that this is really just a small snapshot. This is a glimpse. This is the things that were most interesting to me personally, that stuck out when I tried to figure out what to tell people if I were to stand up and talk about mathematical beauty. And there's a lot, many more notions of what beauty in mathematics should mean. I'm sure not every mathematician agrees with my notions of it. Certainly not in agree with what I end up considering to be actual instances of the rules that I could put down for beauty. There are way more beautiful proofs than what I showed you. I try to focus on things that I could not that, that were not just beautiful, but that would be accessible and quick to walk through so that would, so we wouldn't get bogged down in a proof that is too long for our attention to stick to it for long enough to see it. 
there's a lot more art that contains mathematics. A lot more art that is inspired by math mathematics. A lot more art that is facilitated by mathematics. Arguably, almost all of art history since the invention of the perspective is built on mathematics because it uses perspective. And there are many, many, many more contemporary mathematical artists than the few that I've shown you here. One place to find them is at the Bridges Mathematical Art Conference that shows up every year and focuses on how to use mathematics in art, how to illustrate mathematics through art. and always has a very, very good art exhibit as part of the conference itself. And so everything here is completely drawn from my taste. There's a lot more to discover, and I encourage everyone who feels even the slightest touch, touch of inspiration to go out and seek out the things that you enjoy. And with that, I want to thank you very warmly for giving me the extra attention that I've been overcharging these past five minutes and for listening for me with such enthusiasm as you have been showing this through this talk. Thank you. We have time for questions. Do you go to any of those conferences yourself? I went to Bridges this past summer. That's where I was nominated for Best in Show for the their art exhibit. I wasn't. I didn't win Best in Show. Because the, 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 the people who won Best in Show were so very much better than I was. I think the Best in Show the category that I competed in sculptural arts was this one guy. He had created a cube with sort of an intricate pattern of steel bits woven together in it. So that depending on which direction you look through the cube, you would see a different Beatles portraits. And he managed, ma managed to catch all four in different directions of looking through the cube. And there's no, <laughs> there's no way something like this can be. To run a 3D printing nowadays takes very little programming skill. So a good, there's good software that makes the process of doing it quite seamless. What it does take is you need to somehow get your hands on a three-dimensional model to print. There is a lot of places where, you, quite a few places where you can get them from other designers. Thingiverse is worth, worth mentioning. It's a site where people share three-dimensional designs um, and two-dimensional designs specifically for 3D printing and laser cutting. So they make a design and they put it up as open source and open it up to all the world to use. And so you can go on Thingiverse, find something that appeals to you and print it at home. But in order to do what I did and create something new, something that isn't already designed, you either need enough skill with a 3D modeling program to make your vision become reality. Or, what I did, I have enough skill in programming that you can pick up a programmable 3D modeling software and just code whatever it is you want. Thank you very much. How does the 3D printing work? How does the 3D printing have your office and 3D printing? There's a couple of different ways. Pretty much all of them are based on you slice whatever you want up into thin slices and you create each slice separately in such a way that they bond together. One way is to have a nozzle that uh, pushes out molten plastic, kind of like a hot glue gun. And you move this across and put, put plastic where you want plastic to be. And you don't put plastic where you don't want the plastic to be. And so layer by layer you build it up like that. There's one that I'm really interested in using that I finally will get access to now because the hyperspace I'm a member of I just bought one where you have a epoxy liquid and you expose it with light from below and wherever it's light the epoxy hardens and so you expose it and you lift whatever resin you have hardened a little bit so that the epoxy flows in underneath and you 
close again, lift again, it's close again, and lift again. So that layer by layer, you're uh, solidifying this liquid and you pull out the model out of the liquid. The really cool methods that I've been uh, making other people use, there's a company in New York, Shapeways, where you send your 3D models and they will print them for you. And there's some quality check. They, they punch it up for you, they make sure that it comes up the way that you want. And they use uh, methods where you have a big tub and you put in a thin layer of some sort of powder. It could be ceramics powder that binds together with water. It could be uh, some sort of classical metal sensor that when you heat it, it melts together. You put in a thin layer and you run a little bit either a water nozzle or a laser and you make it fuse together when you need it to be fused together. You put another sheet of powder when you fuse it and shut sheet of powder and fuse it again. One of the cool things that this does is it has intrinsic support for what you're doing. So you can do encapsulated shapes. I didn't bring it today, but I have a version of this that has a little ball on the inside. So the ball on the inside is not something I placed in there. The, the grid is too small to fit the ball through. It's something that I printed in place. And that was printed in this kind of layer by layer powder setup. So when it's done, they pick it up and shake up the powder, and then the ball is in there. And it's loose because it's not connected to this. It stays in there because it had this powder bed to rest on when it was constructed. Those, I think, are the three main ways that we do printing. Works. You can have a nozzle that deposits stuff. You can expose a liquid and lift it out layer by layer. Or you could have layer by layer of a powder that allows you to create something printing and do that. There's an awesome art project. You should look this up at YouTube if you're An artist who went out into the Sahara with a huge Fresno lens. So he was able to focus a lot of sunlight down to just small, small parts. And he had a computer controlling the angle of this Fresno lens so that it could make the focus point move around. And so he takes this and he takes a bucket and he puts in sand, which this being a desert, there's a huge amount of sand to be had. And then he lets the, laser, the, the sun melt the sand. And then he puts on another layer, and he melts the sand, and he puts on another layer. And doing this, he builds these rather crude, because this is nowhere near the precision you would have with a laser, or the precision you would have with a custom built of my synthetic powder. And he ends up building uh, gorgeous, complex shapes by doing 3D printing by hand, using only the sun, a lens, and the sand of the Sahara. So, how long does it take to bring it up? Let's say, like this would be a couple of hours. hours. The layers are very, very thin, because that way you can get smooth surfaces. And you can speed it up by making thicker layers, but then you get a drop that kind of fix it. And it's much nicer if you take the extra time to work with thin, thin layers. Um, is there a property of loss to gain is it a, a mathematical object that you're trying to represent in this situation? I'm sorry, did you mean? Is there a property of loss to gain if you take a mathematical object that you're trying to represent in this situation? Absolutely. Uh, so this thing that I've been waving around is a Klein bottle, or a Klein bottle immersion, I should say, because as it turns out, the Klein bottle is a shape, and I have another one here, that's why I'm giving it out. It's a shape that cannot exist in three dimensions, because it has mathematical properties called normal orientability that is not possible with surfaces embedded in three dimensions. And so in order to do, in order to create something like this, they end up having self-intersections. The surface passes through itself. I have one here, and the tube sort of goes through itself. And we have a self-intersection that runs all the way around here. So the, and this has some, the ring of self-intersections sort of spread out around the entire shape. Because you cannot represent them in three dimensions. So you have to squash them down. And squash them through themselves in order to get them down to three dimensions. There absolutely are properties that you lose by 
constraining yourself to our three-dimensional world. Uh, when you talk about the book that where all the theorems are written, you know, yeah. do you think there is a theorem that defines all the theorems that already exist? It's like similar to what Stephen Hawking proposed, the theory of everything. I'm going to say... So the question is, uh, we, we have Erdős's idea of the book of all the perfect groups. The question, as I understand it, is whether I think there is a theorem of everything, a proof that encompasses every other proof. Is that what you're asking for? And I would be inclined to say I suspect not. And if there is, I suspect it doesn't fit in the book because I suspect that in order to prove everything, you would need so much, so 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 many cases, so many disparate things that you need to do. But if nothing else, you're breaking the economy property of elegance. So instead of having one argument that captures everything, I would much rather think of it as being a library of arguments where. Any one of them happens to be beautiful, but just the same way that there's no one book that captures all possible books, there's no one theorem that just captures all possible theorems. And the theory of everything is not the theory of everything, it's only the theory of the symmetries in physics, all right. together in one field. So it's not completely there. I wanted to make, just call attention to the students and probably the faculty also that uh, thanks to very big help from RBP Kenny Wama and Pat Kent is there also, uh, we recently got the promise of the money needed to construct a maker space that is going to have a very big 3D printer. And when all this happened, I was thinking about engineering, right? So we all thought about engineering. But now with this lecture, I think that maybe that makerspace will help to build collaborations across not only the division, but maybe across the, the whole college with artists and, you know, it, it's actually now you are changing my perspective and think, oh my God, maybe we have a bigger thing than just and maybe he knew it's not here, so he was like, no, it's engineering. But uh, this is very interesting. Um, if we really don't have more questions, maybe we should just thank again the speaker.